hey, I'm recording this video in order to present kind of a new idea in trailer aerodynamics and also kind of as a rebuttal to YouTuber John Cadogan, who uh, kind of made a point that no uneducated idiot using SketchUp at home is going to innovate in the field of aerodynamics. And he might be right about that. For all I know, I could just be, you know, a little bit too hubristic, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just hang my hubris out in the air and, and we'll see how we, we go with that. Uh, now, the first thing I'd like to address, um, Mr. Cadogan had pointed out that uh, on commercial semi-trucks where they have everything to gain from improving aerodynamics, all the aerodynamic effort is focused on the front of the vehicle. And uh, yeah, okay, that's true. But the part that, that John didn't seem to really get is that uh, for one thing, the number one most important job that semi-trucks do is back up to loading docks. They back up to a loading dock, they go somewhere else, and then they back up to a loading dock, and then they go somewhere else and they back up to a loading dock. And so that means that they can't really do a whole lot with the back of the truck because its job is always to back up to a loading dock. They have to make it just a blunt thing with a couple of doors that swing out of the way, and, and that's kind of it. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't do anything with the back of the truck. It's very common to put these trailer tails on. That's a really, really common innovation. And those have been around for a really long time. They cost money. They weigh a little bit, so they impact the payload of the vehicle. Uh, and if they didn't work, they wouldn't keep doing them, basically. Uh, that's really similar to uh, cam aerodynamics, uh, you know, cam back. And what they're doing there is uh, they're taking the back of the vehicle and they're making it so it's not so blunt that the flow separates. Uh, so the flow wants to kind of just follow along. And I think that's called the Reynolds number, something like that. Uh, the flow will follow along the back of it. And then this actual back of the vehicle, the extreme back, is the part that really suffers a lot of drag because it's a low pressure area. And that low pressure is basically just sucking back on the back of the vehicle. Uh, the fewer square inches that is, then the fewer pounds because it's pounds per square inch, PSI. Uh, so you can see like in this one here, um, this one you can see that there's a large amount of flow separation on the back of this. I think this looks like one of those French Citroens or something like that, but you can see all the flow separation. So everything back here would be a low pressure area subject to you know a lot of aerodynamic drag, uh, where this car here, um, obviously a much more modern one, but still is constrained by the dimensions of a human being sitting in it, uh, would have a much smaller amount of aerodynamic drag because the flow is able to stay attached and then uh, only have to separate here at the extreme back. And, and that's pretty much what we've got with these semi-trailer tails. They just make a little cam back. It reduces the square footage, the, the surface area at the back here, and prevents some of that drag. So in the context of uh, recreational trailers, caravans, RVs, whatever you want to call it, uh, what we'll really frequently see is something like, uh, you know, they'll take the, the back of the trailer and they'll put like, a, like an arc on it somewhere like this. And we'll just go ahead and do like, like that. And then they'll just uh, go ahead and knock that off. And, and I'm not really very good at using SketchUp, so please feel welcome to make fun of me in the comments there. I'm totally okay with that. You know, they'll knock the back of the trailer off and, um, you know, maybe they'll take something like uh, the front of it and they'll just do a little something like this. Uh, oh, something like that. And they'll just knock the front of it off. And they go, there we go. It's aerodynamic because it's not a square. Uh, you know, and, and so what you end up with is, yeah, the front of it has this kind of little, you know, radius on it. And I'm sure that does help more than zero. Uh, and the back of it, again, has this radius, but in order to maximize ceiling space, you know, the usable area where an adult human being can stand up, uh, they start this pretty far back. And so what you end up with is that flow separation. So you don't really get like very much of what's called the cam back or the, the aerodynamic effect from this. You really only get it like up to around here. And then after that, it's turbulent separated flow. You get basically from here down. This is all just, you know, the vacuum back here and it's drag. Um, that doesn't really help a whole lot. That's, you know, it's just not going to do it. Uh, similarly, uh, something else that we see pretty often with these RVs is that really they just do something kind of like this. They just, uh, you know, they just kind of chop the front off and uh, the front goes away and they go, look, it's got an angle. That means it's aerodynamic because whenever wind hits it in the front here, it goes, psh, shoots up over top of it and problem solved. Uh, which again, maybe that's like marginally better than just a flat blunt front end. Uh, but I, I really don't think it does a whole lot. Uh, I, I don't think that helps really significantly. Um, otherwise, we would see the front of like cars that way. And I think the closest we ever saw was maybe a Ford Aerostar during the 1980s. And even that had a pretty good rake to it, honestly. So another thing we see frequently in recreational RVs is that they just make them telescopic. You know, they just make it so that they can, they can shrink down in some way. 
Um, and that's kind of cool. Like that, you know, that helps a little bit, but there are a bunch of drawbacks that I think are not necessary. They're necessary with that design, but I think they're not necessary. Uh, one of them, for example, is, uh, well, something like this here. Uh, this doesn't actually solve the problem of having a very unaerodynamic seven foot tall, seven foot wide hole you got to punch in the air. Um, you can see that this gives you the ability of having something that's maybe 20 feet wide, and that's kind of cool. You get more floor space inside of it, so it feels more expansive. Uh, but it doesn't correct the aerodynamics because you still have that flow separation on the back of it. So it's just really a seven foot wide, seven foot tall vacuum on the back of the thing that you have to somehow, somehow fight against. Uh, but also you've got three layers of walls. So, right, you've got this wall, you've got that wall, and you've got that wall, all of which weigh something. So they all have quite a bit of weight. They also cost you some volume inside of it because, you know, everything has to be small enough to fit inside the smallest part of it. Uh, and also, you can't really have anything on the walls on either of these two sections because the smaller one has to be able to slide in past them. Uh, so this becomes kind of a real puzzle on what you can and can't have and where you can and can't have it. Uh, it's a lot of weight because you've got three times as much structure. You've got an inner structure, you've got a second structure, you've got a third structure. So this thing's got to weigh an absolute ton. Um, and it's got to rattle and just have you know, quite a lot of structural issues, I think. I don't think it's going to be something that's going to uh, to really be very practical as more than just a design exercise. And fundamentally, it doesn't solve the aerodynamic problem at all. It just gives you more, uh, you know, more floor space. And you could probably get the same floor space by just simply making it longer, and you wouldn't have any aerodynamic penalty or much weight penalty, if any at all. Uh, so this uh, parks in a smaller space, maybe? I don't know. I don't really see this as having much future, honestly. You've got these things. These are really common. And these guys here, what they do is they've just got a tenty part that folds down. You can see the top just telescopes down to it, and you end up with something very short. Uh, so it has very low aerodynamic drag, and that's pretty cool. That's you know These have been popular for a really long time, at least in the U.S. Um, this is an incredibly popular design, and so that at least proves that there's some merit to it. If it didn't work, it wouldn't have become popular. Uh, the negatives to it, of course, are that all of your cabinetry has to be down here below crotch level basically um, so your cabinetry is always really really low uh, there's no insulation to this so if you want to heat it in the summertime or it looks like this one or see heat it in the winter time this one looks like it may have an ac unit at the top too so if you want to keep it hot or cold uh, you've got essentially no insulation uh, along the top of it um, the canvas kind of ages over time um, you know insects will get through the the uh, mesh it's just not really an ideal solution it's it's something that's worked really well but I wouldn't call it great. Uh, and then you've got stuff like the A-liner. These are also fairly popular. These have been produced for quite a while. Uh, the difficulty with them, if it's not obvious, this line here in the middle is a hinge, including in the door. And so to, to fold this up, you fold this whole triangle inwards, and then the other side triangle folds inwards, and then these, these guys here flop down, and then the back flops down, and the, the front flops down. So you end up with, you know, like six layers of structure all across the top there, all you know, slapping against each other as you go down the road, and the aluminum's beating itself up and making a lot of noise. It weighs quite a lot. Um, and again, all your cabinetry, everything, furniture, everything has to be below this line so that when it folds up, it, it fits down there. If you ever wanted to see what that was like, you know, go into your kitchen, stand on top of a step stool and try to operate your stove and see how much fun it is cooking by your knees. It's just, it's, it's not really all that great. And another drawback is that for most people who are of a typical adult height, this, this door is actually a pretty short door on these. You have to stoop getting into it. Uh, you can really only stand up right in this middle area if you're, you know, 5 foot 10 or something like that. Uh, at the edges here, you know, if you've got a little breakfast nook or something, a little table you're going to sit in, you have to kind of stoop down before getting into it. And also if you're doing, you know, like cowgirl or something in bed, um, you're going to have to watch so you don't hit your head while bouncing around, uh, you know, back there. So it's, it's really not an ideal solution. It's one that sort of works. You know, people buy these. This is a real product, and it's been a real product for a while. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement on that as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about all the things that I think don't work, let's talk about what I think will work. This right here. This seems pretty simple, right? I think you can get the picture very quickly. Uh, what we have is we have the same 7 foot by 7 foot hole to punch in the air, so you don't get any aerodynamic benefit up there. And the first third of it, roughly, is immovable. It doesn't change. This is specifically so that you can have something like a bed you don't have to fold up, because folding things up sucks. Nobody wants to have to fold things up. Uh, and nobody wants to have to deal with, like, cabinets that are moving up and down or things that are, like, in a weird, awkward location. 
Uh, the only thing that moves is that your two sidewalls hinge inward somewhere pretty far forward, far enough forward that you don't have a steep rake on these sides because if you get a steep rake, you have that aerodynamic separation and you lose the benefit really. Um, so by keeping this rake relatively shallow, you get to keep your aerodynamic attachment and then your actual drag is reduced to this area here that's about half the size of the area that's uh, previously on there. You know, instead of something like 50 square feet of drag, you have something like 25 square feet that you have to close up. And that means, you know, if it's the same amount of uh, negative PSI or, you know, PSI pressure differential, well, half as much surface area means half as much drag back there. Obviously, the trailer itself wouldn't have half as much drag because that's not the only part of it that contributes to drag. But for the part that the rear comprises, yeah, it would drop it by probably 50-ish percent, amateur opinion. So how would this work in practice, and why is this better than the other solutions? I'm glad you asked, even though you didn't ask. So I'm just going to go ahead and take this guy here, and I'm going to move it way up out of the way so we're not having to look at it. That's just the roof. It's not actually going to move in a real production version of this, if anyone ever would be producing one. Uh, but for the purpose of illustration, let's go ahead and look down on top of it. Um, what we have here is we have hinges at the front of each of these and, of course, hinges on the doors so that the doors can, you know, over, overlap each other and be roughly parallel. And you'll notice that I didn't really pay too much attention to the laws of physics in case of clipping through the walls there because uh, I'm sure you get the picture, basically. We have a kitchen and cabinets and we have a large array of toilets because that's important to be able to use the toilet while you use the stove. And... The natural walkway that you would ordinarily have in a recreational trailer is what provides the room for this to hinge in and out. And that means that you don't have to mount your cabinets too low for anyone to, to use them. You don't have to really have anything mounted in any sort of particularly weird place. And the only part of the trailer that doubles up on mass is the back door. There's no other part of it where you have to have two or three or four layers that hinge or flap or overlap on each other in order to make this function because the roof is just simply enough there to keep, you know, rain and whatnot out of it. Uh, and you would have just some brush seals of some sort across the top here. Uh, and then, of course, the bottom of it, the chassis, would just be your normal frame. And, and that's going to be, you know, what it is. I don't think you can really fix that in any particular way with uh, a hinging design. Uh, but again, you would just have some kind of brush seals along the bottom there to keep, you know, drafts and heat and cool in and out of it. Um, your floor would naturally want to be out of some sort of material that's weather resistant so that it doesn't mind the fact that it's going to be exposed part of the time. Uh, and then you just hinge it open or shut depending on whether you're underway or not. Uh, for commercial trailers, for truckers, this doesn't affect whether or not they can back up to a dock door. Uh, they could back up to a dock door with this closed and just open these two doors. You know, just one would hinge out and then the other would hinge out past it. Obviously not in my poorly constructed SketchUp version, but in a real one, they could make it so that these just hinge out together. Uh, or alternately, um, you know, if they do happen to back up to the dock and they forget to deploy the doors, it would be no different than when a trucker backs up to a dock now and forgets to open his doors. He drives forward four feet, the doors open, and then he backs back up. Same idea with this. Uh, and of course, for a trucker, when he's doing his return trips uh, and doesn't have anything in, in the trailer because he may not have secured a, a load on the way back, uh, or he may only be chartered by a company that does one-way loads, on the way back, he closes it up and gets way better fuel efficiency. So I think that's a realistic solution to the aerodynamic problem of trailers, whether commercial or recreational, uh, and something that I've never seen anyone do before. I've never seen this, this concept either in you know theory or in practice if you have, let me know about it. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see how it worked out and what problems people encountered with it. Uh, there is one other neat thing that comes along with doing this that I think uh, probably bears mentioning, and that's uh, in terms of visibility. So what I've done here is I've put up a glass wall on the side of this so you can kind of see where the corner of it would be if it was a square trailer that didn't have this uh, feature. And what we'll do is I'm just going to go ahead and move the camera around here, and you'll notice something real quick. See the mirror? The driver can see somebody who's right here. The driver of that vehicle can see somebody who's in this blind spot. Whereas if they were backing up and they had a fully square trailer, they'd have to wait till they were here before they could see the object they were backing towards. That's a lot of extra visibility. And that's true whether the trailer is at an angle, whether they're, you know, they're, they're driving uh, around a corner like this, or if it's straight ahead, they still get a little bit of benefit from that angle they still get a little bit of benefit from being able to see a little bit further around the trailer. So that's kind of an extra bonus that you get for free along with improving your aerodynamics. 
anyway, I hope that's all been explanatory and exciting and fun and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, just wanted to kind of rebut that I think that someone still can innovate, even if they don't know really a lot about the topic. Just trying is a really good way to make things work. And, and a lot of times I think innovation does come from people who don't know they can't. Uh, so that's, that's the lesson. If you, you know, if you don't know you can't, go for it, man. Give it a try.